Guys, I am back with another blockchain tutorial. Now, I'm super excited to share it with you today. So I'm going to show you how to create a blockchain-based file storage website, just like Dropbox. And as always, I'm going to show you the hottest skills and technologies that you can use in order to, you know, land a high paying job, become a freelancer, you know, whatever you want to do. We're going to use the Ethereum blockchain and also IPFS. And these are two really in demand technologies. But don't worry, you don't have to be a programmer right now or know anything about blockchain to get started today. I'm going to show you everything step by step. I'll show you how to create the Ethereum smart contracts, the Solidity programming language, put them on a blockchain, and then also create an app that you can you know, show your friends and also use for your portfolio if you're trying to get hired. So before we get into all that, you know, if you're new around here, hey, I'm Gregory and on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, and I bet you are because you're watching this video, then smash that like button down below and subscribe to this channel. And if you like this tutorial and you want to take the next step, uh, or you just want to pause this video, take a massive shortcut entirely, then head on over to dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. I can show you how to build a step-by-step -step blockchain application, a pro-level application that goes way beyond this tutorial. Just click the link down below to sign up today. All right, with that being said, let's jump in and get started. Here's a quick demo of the application we're going to build together in this tutorial. This is a decentralized Dropbox clone that runs in the blockchain and also the interplanetary file system, IPFS. This will allow us to upload files in a decentralized way and also share them with others in a trustless, censorship-resistant fashion. Let's take a look at how this application will work. So here's a quick diagram of how a traditional web application would work. Uh, let's say Dropbox, for example. So when you use the Dropbox website, you know, you get on your web browser and you talk to a server. And this is where all the code and the data and all of the files for Dropbox lives, you know, on the central server. So all of the backend logic is, you know, inside of an application like this. All the code is in a database and all the files also live here too. And when you store files in the cloud in this way, this is a very centralized model. So any of your files can be censored at any time. And you also have to pay to store files here for a long-term basis. But by contrast, here's how the application that we're going to build together today will work. Okay, So instead of uh, you know talking to a web server, a centralized version of Dropbox, we're going to build a decentralized version where you use your web browser and you connect with a blockchain wallet to the blockchain. And this is where we will store all the code for our application inside of smart contracts. We're going to use Ethereum for this tutorial. So we'll write Ethereum smart contracts uh, to store you know, the location of the files. And then we'll store these files on the interplanetary file system, so IPFS. This will work a lot like a blockchain, but it's a different way of storing files, also decentralized. And this will allow us to store these files here for free for the long term. And then also they'll be censorship resistant. No central party can take them down. And here is a technical diagram of how this application will work. So these are all the technologies that we'll use to build this application. So we'll see these here in a minute when we install the dependencies and also as we build the project. But basically a user will interact with the application that we build in React.js. And um, this application will talk to the blockchain. So we're going to talk to Ethereum in this tutorial, and we'll use a blockchain called the Ganache, which is a development version of Ethereum. And our React application will also talk to IPFS, the interplanetary file system, whenever we upload these files. So we'll upload them to IPFS. The, we'll develop smart contracts that store the location of these files. We'll put them on Ganache. And then this will allow the user to you know, view and download files from this React application, as well as upload and store them. So here's an even more technical diagram. <laughs> this is from the DAP creator's perspective, where they will connect this React application through the, through the development lifecycle with the Truffle framework. So if you want to study this more in depth, I highly recommend pausing this video and looking over this. Now let's install the dependencies we need for this tutorial. The first dependency is Node.js. This is going to allow us to install all the packages on our computer as well as run our client side application. So you can see if you have Node already installed by going to your terminal and typing Node-V. So I'm using Node 9.10.0. I would recommend using the exact same version for best uh, results during this tutorial, but you can probably use the latest version if you really want to and you know what you're doing. So uh, you can download Node directly from the website, or you can use a command line tool like Homebrew, a package manager to, to install it that way. The next dependency is the Truffle framework. This is a framework for creating Ethereum smart contracts. We can write Ethereum smart contracts with the Solidity programming language, write tests against them, and deploy them to a blockchain with Truffle, as well as many other things which we'll see in this tutorial. You can install Truffle from your command line like this, say npm install dash dash g truffle at version uh, 5.1.39. 
The next dependency is the Ganache personal blockchain. This is a blockchain that will run on our computer. We can simply download it and run transactions in the blockchain, deploy smart contracts to it without having to pay any real money. So go ahead and download Ganache. You can just click the version for your operating system here. And whenever it's finished downloading, you can open it and you'll see that you have a brand new blockchain running on your computer just like this. You'll see lots of different accounts funded with 100 fake Ether. And don't get too excited because this isn't actually worth anything. The last dependency is the MetaMask extension for Google Chrome. Most modern web browsers won't connect to the blockchain out of the box, and so we need to install a special browser extension to do that. That's exactly what MetaMask does. It's an Ethereum wallet that turns our browser into a blockchain browser. So go to the Google Chrome web store, find MetaMask, and click install. And once you have it installed, you should see a Fox icon in the top right-hand corner and just walk through the setup steps to get that started. Now let's start coding the project. So head on over to your terminal and uh, clone this repository from GitHub. So I'll put a link down in the description below. This is just the DAP University uh, GitHub repository or GitHub organization. And this D storage repository is where all the final source code is for the application we're gonna build today. Uh, as well as this diagram here, which we saw a minute ago. So, um, you know, if you want to ever check your progress with the final code solution in this tutorial, then you can just look at this repository. You can download it. But what I'm going to do is actually clone a starter branch to, so we can get it started fast. Don't have to build everything from scratch. Uh, you can see this, you know, starter code branch here. That's the one that we're going to download right now. So you could switch to that and, uh, you know, click the download button here, right? Download a zip file if you want to, but uh, I'm going to do it with Git. So I'll do it like this. We'll just copy this URL here and go to our terminal. Say git clone dash B. It's a specific branch. So starter code. All right. And then paste in the URL here. And then I'm going to call this, uh, we'll call it, uh, you know, D storage. All right. So it looks like, uh, sorry, you got to change this URL here. Make sure you just go back here. I, I did the master branch, so don't do that. Just copy this, replace that one more time. All right, try this. Boom, there we go, awesome. So now we'll enter that newly created directory like this. We'll say CD D storage, all right? And now we will uh, install all the project dependencies like this with node, say npm install, and then wait for that to finish. All right, now that's finished. Uh, let's go ahead and test out the starter code. Let's go ahead and start the server for the web application. So I'm going to open a new terminal tab here and I'm going to say npm run start. And this will uh, you know start up the front end application for us in a new window here. And here you can see the uh, starter code for the you know application. So uh, we'll come back and edit this later. All right, we're going to code this uh, tutorial out in two sections. We're going to start with the back end, the blockchain part. We'll code the smart contracts put them on a blockchain um, at, as their final version. And then we'll come back and, you know, wire up this uh, client side application that you see here to actually talk to those smart contracts and build out the, um, you know, build out the user interface. So I'm going to leave my web server running here for now. We'll, we'll, we will revisit this, like I said. So let's go ahead and start coding at the back end. Um, so the first thing we need to do is make sure that Ganache is running. All right. Uh, so go find Ganache wherever you downloaded it and open it. And whenever you have this running, you know, you'll have a development blockchain running. You'll have, uh, 10 different accounts with a hundred fake ether in it. This is, you know, Ethereum cryptocurrency. It's not worth anything in the real world. Don't get excited, but, uh, we need this running in order to code out the smart contracts, uh, that we'll put on this, uh, you know, that will, that will create in this tutorial. So. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and open this in my text editor. I mean, Sublime Text. You can use whatever text editor you'd like. But uh, we'll go ahead and take a quick tour of the project. All right. So uh, I'm going to look at the truffle-config file. First and foremost, this is how we configure the truffle project to talk to the blockchain. You can see uh, there's some kind of advanced configuration in here, but the most important part that you need to understand is this. Uh, this is how we talk to Ganache. So this is the development network configuration for localhost sorry, localhost port 7545. Um, and this is the blockchain that we're going to use. So if you want to use a test network later, you can always use Robston uh, because it's pre-configured for you. But uh, we're going to use Ganache in this tutorial. All right. So next is the source directory. Uh, this is where the front end and the back end part of the application will live. 
the uh, components directories here. This is for all the client side code for React JS. We'll come back to this later. Uh, but the important part that we're going to focus on now is this contracts directory. This is where all the Ethereum smart contracts written in Solidity will go for the project. In this case, we have the migration contract, which comes standard with every Truffle project because we're using Truffle to develop this. That's what you see. That's what all this code is. Um, but we're going to create a um, our own smart contract here called D storage. Okay. And so you can see that here. So we've got some basic uh, code in this file already. We basically have the skeleton of the smart contract uh, with a bunch of uh, instructions here on how to create it. So we're using this starter template so that we don't have to create everything from scratch so we can make the tutorial faster and so that you can uh, sort of see the important parts without you know having to do everything step by step. Um, and so we'll use this as a starting point. All right. So um, I'll explain this file. At the very top, we have uh, the Solidity programming language version, just Pragma Solidity version 0.5.0. And then next we have the uh, beginning of the smart contract uh, code. So, so contract D storage, that's what the app's going to be called. Uh, this is just the name of the smart contract. And then we put all the code for it inside of these curly braces here. All right. So we can see that we have, uh, you know, several different, uh, you know, comments here with some instructions. So we'll just go through these one by one. We'll start off with uh, the basics. We'll just start off with a, a basic variable. All right. So uh, inside of Solidity, um, you know, it, it's a full blown programming language. It's it's a Turing complete language. Uh, looks a lot like JavaScript. So if you ever coded JavaScript before, you might this might look somewhat familiar. All right, so kind of user friendly. It has variables. It has loops. It has data structures like arrays, strings, functions, all that kind of stuff. Okay, and we're gonna see lots of examples of those uh, inside this. Okay, so um, this smart contract today is gonna be pretty simple. Let me tell you what it's gonna do. Go back to our diagram here. So whenever we access the application, you know, we're going to talk to the, the blockchain and also IPFS. So uh, how the user flow is going to go is, is like this. Basically, uh, someone's going to talk to the React application. They're going to upload their Dropbox-like file to IPFS. And then IPFS is going to return a hash, okay? Uh, so you can see what an IPFS hash looks like right here. Here's an example of an IPFS-based website. All right, here's what a hash looks like. Okay, so IPFS hash looks like this. Let me change the font size here. Okay, so it's going to return something looks like this. Okay, and this is really just the ID or the location of the file on the IPFS network. And then um, once we get that hash back, we will store it on the smart contract right here that we code out on Ganache, and that's what we're going to do right now. So this smart contract holds uh, all of the uh, hashes in one place and puts them on the blockchain. So uh, basically the Dropbox is going to be like, sorry, the smart contract will be like our database that, that tells us where all the files are, and the hash of the uh, file IPFS will be the location of the actual file, and then we can retrieve it uh, from IPFS once we know that location. Okay, it's kind of like the address, basically. So um, this contract needs to do a few things. Um, let me just pull up the code here. Yeah, we're basically it's it's just going to be a we're going to use the blockchain as a database to store the location of these files, and the smart contract is going to facilitate all that. So we'll we'll go through all that one by one. Okay. So we'll start off with the basic tests. Um, let's just give let's just give this a variable name here. So we'll say string uh, public name equals d storage. Okay. So this is um, basically how we create a uh, a, a variable in Solidity. This is a, this is a state variable called name. And it's a string, okay. So that's why I tell it string here because Solidity is a statically typed language. We have to tell it what the what data type the variable is before we create one, okay, and then it can't change after that. Uh, and we call it dstorage, and then uh, we call it public so that we can access this variable outside the smart contract. So that's different from a local variable, which we'll see later when we start building out these functions. Um, but here's the basic name, okay. So let's let's witness this in action. Let's go to our uh, terminal here, uh, and let's open this in our console. 
So first, we're going to say um, truffle migrate. Okay. And we're going to put this, uh, you know, work in progress copy of the smart contract on the blockchain. And we're going to interact with it in our truffle console to see this behavior in action. Okay. So before we do that, we need to make sure we have a migration file. So we can go to this migrations directory and we can see this uh, deploy contracts file. So what we want to do is update this. All right. So every truffle project comes with this initial migrations file. Okay. But we want to add a migration here that puts the smart contract in the blockchain so we can use this as a starter code. So we'll just copy this and then, all right, so we'll just say, we'll just say uh, like this, const d storage equal to artifacts require d storage. Okay, so that just pulls the smart contract into our file here. And then we're gonna deploy it like this. So just deploy or deploy d storage. All right, it's pretty simple. So now we can uh, put it on the blockchain like this. Say truffle migrate. I'm going to go ahead and use the reset flag here in case there's any uh, uh, old code inside of here. I recommend you do the same. I, I typically do it in development just as a easy practice. I'll explain this more later, but okay, awesome. So now it's on the blockchain and let's open it in the terminal like this in the truffle console. Say truffle console. Oops, sorry, typo. And then uh, we can fetch a copy of the smart contract in this JavaScript runtime environment here. So inside the Travel Console, we're interacting with a smart contract, which is written in the Solidity programming language. But here inside the Travel Console, we'll, we'll write JavaScript commands to uh, interact with the blockchain, interact with the smart contract, all that kind of stuff. So I'll show you what that looks like. We'll say, uh, you know, dstorage equals await uh, dstorage.deployed. All right, this will get a copy of the smart contract from the blockchain. And then I can say uh, de name equals, oh, all right, well, here you go. Some people get confused because this says undefined. All right, that's just the, uh, this is the console log value. It's not the actual return value. So I can say dstorage, just call the variable again. And then boom, it appears on the screen. So here's a JavaScript copy of the smart contract. Okay, so now we can, uh, read this name variable value from the code like this. I can say uh, name equals await uh, d storage lowercase d uh, dot name, all right? I'll say undefined, but uh, we call the name variable again and then boom, there we go. Awesome. So um, that's how we can, you know, talk to the blockchain uh, with the Truffle Console, talk to the smart contract with Truffle Console. And this just really makes sure that we've got everything set up properly, that we can talk to this smart contract, that this name var variable was set correctly. You get a basic idea of how uh, you can create variables and set solidity. That's the basic smoke test, just to make sure that we're on the right track, all right? So with that being confirmed, let's go ahead and code out the rest of this smart contract. So like I said, we're going to use a smart contract to store these hashes of files on IPFS, okay? And so what we want to do is um, code out a basic database-like behavior. So we can do that with something called a mapping inside Solidity. So that looks like this. Um, so a mapping is a key value store. So basically, like, you give it a key and it returns a value. So, like, you know, key equals one. And then the value equals, you know, like some IPFS hash, all right? And then like, you know, key, key equals two. And then the value equals, uh, you know, like some different hash, like KB1456, blah, 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 blah. Something like that. Like these would be different files. And so that's how a database would work where you say, you know, file number one, the value is this, file number two, the value is this, you know, file number three, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And as you add more files, these numbers increase. And then, you know, it uh, maps to the special hash for the file in IPFS. That, that's what a regular database will do. And that's exactly what we can do uh, with the blockchain, with the smart contract. So we store, we, we're gonna program this thing called a mapping to do this. It's basically gonna give us an ID key value pair relationship, just like that. So we'll say mapping. And so it, what we do here is give it the, you know, the key and then the value, okay? And that's how we create the mapping. And we give it a name, you know, files, 
Okay. We also call it public. So we can, well, anyways, we'll get there in a second. So the key is going to be, uh, we have to give it the data type for the key and the data type for the value. So um, the key is going to be an unsigned integer. So you int. So this is basically just a number without a minus sign in front of it. That's hence, you know, not signed, unsigned. So it can't be negative. Um, and then the value is actually going to be a file. Okay. And then uh, we're going to call this public so that we can access this with a function outside of the smart contract, just like this. All right. So the data type for the ID is an unsigned integer, just like we saw a second ago, you know, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, et cetera, et cetera, onto, you know, a very large number. And then the 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 return value is gonna be a file. Okay. So, but what is this file? Where does it come from? Well, we're gonna create it. All right. And we do that with something called a struct inside of Solidity. So a struct, Solidity allows us to create our own data types. So you can see data types like, you know, uh, string, mapping, array, uh, all that kind of stuff. These are standard data types, but now we can create our own like this. We can say struct file, all right? And this is basically gonna give us, you know, somewhat like a database object, kind of, kind of like a database object that gets returned uh, whenever we, uh, you know, read it from the blockchain. So this allows us to store all the files, all the attributes of the file that we need for Dropbox, okay? So um, we can define the data type and then, you know, give it a bunch of attributes like this, okay? So we can say, you know, it has a file ID of an, if that's an unsigned integer. It has a file hash for IPFS, that's a string. Uh, it has a, a file size, file type, name, file description, upload time, and then the uploader, okay? So uh, that's what the that's what a file struct looks like. So going back to our mapping, we have this unsigned integer, the ID, and then the file, and then this is the this are all the attributes of the file from this custom struct that we create. Okay. So now uh, we want to actually create a function that uploads files and stores them. Okay. Um, so we need a way to to add new files and then a way to fetch files. Okay. So we'll create an upload file function like this. We'll basically just say, you know, function upload file. Okay. And then we'll write all the code for that inside of here. So we can copy this and then put it inside of here. These can be our notes for what needs to happen in here. All right. So, um, yeah, we'll call upload file. This would be the, the function that we create and it's going to, create a new one of these files and put it inside this mapping so that we can read it later uh, from the blockchain. So um, we can add a new file like this. We want to first want to create a new file struct. So let's just, I'm going to do it at the top of this file so we don't get too confused here. Um, we'll say, you know, file. And then we want to add all these, you know, attributes. So like file ID might be one, uh, you know, file hash might be like ABC one, two, three, uh, you know, the unsigned integer might file size might be, you know, 10, 24, uh, you know, name might be foobar description, foobar baz, and then, um, Upload time might be some like timestamp and then the uploader might be zero X zero, right? So that's, that's how you would create a new file. So you're basically, you're creating a new file, you're instantiating a new file struct like this. And then uh, with an ID of one, these are just hard coded values. We'll change this, but this is just an example of how it would work. Okay. And then you could add it to the file ma files mapping this thing right here, files like this, you could say files. All right. And then you'd say, you know, one equals this. And that would be like, we're going to create a new file here. Boom. And then in the same line, we assign it to the new files mapping like this ID one. Okay. So, um, you know, the, the, you could just hard code this function and that's what it would do. It'd create a new file every single time, uh, with the ID of one. Okay. So let's get, uh, more dynamic. Let's not hard code this. Okay. 
So the first thing we'll do is actually replace these values. We want to get the file ID, the file hash. So we're going to pass those in inside of a function. So we'll say, uh, we'll add some arguments like this. We'll say string memory uh, file hash. Okay. And then that could replace this. Okay. Boom. All right. And then also we'll do the same thing for these other arguments, you know, file size, uh, all that kind of stuff. Okay. So I'm just gonna replace all these here like this. Boom. All right. So file hash, file size, file type, file name, file description. And then also while I'm here, I'm gonna call this public so that we can call this function outside the smart contract, just like we did here. All right. And here. Okay. And so now what we're going to do is replace all of these. Um, so after the ID, we'll say this file hash, file size, file type, file name, file description. Okay. And then um, next we want to replace the timestamp. Uh, what's really cool is we can generate a timestamp inside Solidity like this. We can just say now. That's pretty cool. And it will store the current time uh, from the blockchain into this right here. And so next we want to uh, determine the person who's calling this function, right? So the cool thing about Solidity is it has a, a global variable that allows us to find that information. Uh, there's a global variable called message, so MSG. And say, we just say message.sender, and that will give us the address of the person who's calling the function. And that way we can just save that as the uploader here. So there's there's a couple, two, two little pieces of magic. The upload time, we can just use the now timestamp. And then uh, message.sender, will give us access to the person who's uploading it. So essentially the uploader and that allows us to save the uploader here. Okay. All right. So now um, that, that gets most of the dynamic behavior in place. The next thing we want to do is uh, replace this one here. So if we were going to leave this code as is, basically it would overwrite this every single time and you would just create a new file with ID of one. But we don't want to do that. We want a new ID every time we call this function. So the first time we call it, this will be file number one. The next time we want file number two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to use something called a counter cache. All right. So we'll create a new, um, we'll create a new variable inside of Solidity like this. We'll say boom. So uh, file count. So uh, uint public a file count. We're going to start at zero. And then basically what's going to happen is we'll use this file count as an ID management system. It's a counter cache. So before we get to this line, we want it to be one the first time we call the function. So it's currently zero. Um, so we'll say, you know, file count equals uh, file count, you know, plus one. All right. And then we'll use file count here for the ID. Okay. And then that will give us a... Uh, you know, a complete function. The, the, the guy, that'll give us all the basic uh, behavior we need for the function. This is how we'll create new IDs every time this function is called. And that's really the core uh, functionality. But we want to make this a little better. Uh, we want to say we can write this as a shortcut. Instead of saying file count equals file count plus one, we can just add one every time this function is called like this and just say file count plus plus. Okay, and then boom, that will actually increment file count by one every time this function is called. It's a nice shortcut. It's very common in other programming languages as well. All right, so yeah, that's the basic functionality for this upload file function, okay? So it'll work just like this. Uh, we wouldn't really have to do anything else if we wanted sort of a minimum viable product, uh, but we want to make it a little better, all right? We want to first um, add some requirements here to make sure that they don't uh, <laughs> don't break. Our app doesn't break whenever people will try to use it. Okay, so um, we can do that like this. We can use something in Solidity called a require, uh, so a require function. So we use a function that looks like this, and this function, what it does is it uh, it makes sure that something is true before it continues execution. So we can pass in a special value here or an expression like, you know, true or false, all right? Or an expression that evaluates true or false. I'll show you that in a second. But basically, if whatever's passed into require is true, um, then 
this function will continue executing and then it'll actually get to this line and we'll see file count increment and we'll see the files added to this. But if this evaluates false, um, then this will blow up, an exception will be thrown and these lines here will not execute, okay? So um, yeah, that's the basic idea. But we can, you know, uh, you, we can we can create expressions inside of here rather than just hard coding true or false. So we could say like, you know, one plus one equals two, that would evaluate to true. And then in this case require would be, this requirement would be fulfilled and this would execute. But if we said two plus two equals three or four right here, right? Then this would of course evaluate to false and then these lines would not run, okay? So uh, we're gonna basically do this several times. So what we wanna do is basically make sure that the uh, file hash exists. So like somebody passes in a file hash, right? So what we can do is say require, um, by, we can require the file hash length is greater than zero. So first we convert this to bytes, all right? And then uh, we call length. And if it's longer than zero, then we know that the hash exists and it will satisfy this requirement. And um, then, oops, sorry. Then, uh, yeah, this will work. So same thing for file type, all right? Okay. And then we'll do it for the description, the name, the and the name, all right? It's the very same thing over and over and over. We'll just do it for all these things, all right? So uh, next we want to make sure that the uploader address exists. Okay, so we'll do that like this. All right. So basically we say message sender, which is, you know, what we used here. We want to say that it's not equal to the zero address. Okay. And then last, we want to make sure the file size is, uh, is this. All right. So it's bigger than zero. All right. So that adds some requirements so the app won't break when people try to use it uh, the wrong way, essentially. All right, so uh, next what we wanna do is actually trigger an event. So Solidity allows you to have events that can be subscribed to by external consumers, namely our client side application. Uh, and we wanna trigger this event down here so that we can know any time that a file is uploaded, all right? So we'll just create a new event like this. So sort of like a struct, we just say event, uh, file uploaded, okay? And then we can add all the arguments inside of here for the application, or sorry, for the file upload. It'll look almost exactly like the uh, file, but we'll just do it like this, right? So it's basically the exact same arguments. It looks almost the exact same, all right? Except we use commas here instead of, uh, you know, semicolons. All right, at the very bottom of the file, we'll do this. We'll just say, uh, you can trigger the event like this, say emit, you know, file uploaded. All right, that's how we trigger the event. And then we're just gonna pass in all of the uh, same variables that we passed in here, okay? So we'll just do that here, all right? So boom, there we go. That is our complete smart contract, okay? So um, let's go ahead and finish it off. Let's go to our terminal and uh, Clear this out. I'm gonna say truffle migrate dash dash reset. Okay. So this will compile it. Make sure we didn't have any coding errors first. All right, that'll be the first step. So this is compiling contracts. All right, so we got a little issue here. Um, so let's see here. Expected this, but got constructor. Okay. So I see what the problem is. Let me just fix it really fast. Okay. Uh, we forgot to add a semicolon here after the event, all right? So the, the correct code solution is in the GitHub repository. So if you have any issues like this, um, you know, you can just check your code solution. So that's good. The compiler is doing its job, uh, but now it's compiled properly. So you can see the first step is compilation. This basically just checks for any coding errors. Um, there are no coding errors, so it migrates the contract to the network, okay? So one thing I want to note here is that we use truffle migrate with the reset flag. And I did this at the beginning of the video, but I want to explain what this is. So smart contract code is immutable. That's the whole idea. Once you create a smart contract and put it on the blockchain, it can't change, okay? 
So uh, if you want to create, if you want to update your code inside of Truffle, like we did here, you know, we started off and just had a basic smart contract that had the name variable, but then we added a bunch of code. The only thing you can do is uh, deploy a new copy of it to the blockchain, okay? And that's what we do with the reset flag here, okay? So it, it, it puts a new copy on the blockchain and then updates Truffle to know the address of the new uh, smart contract, okay? So... Um, now that that's done, we want to go ahead and continue on by building out the client side portion of the application. Uh, I'm going to make a quick note here, uh, I'm a little short on time for the video today. Um, some of my other tutorials, you know, I like to write tests for these projects, um, but I've gone ahead and included the tests inside of this, uh, you know, code solution here. Uh, I'm not going to have, I don't have time today to write out the tests step by step, but if you want to get uh, and you want to see an example of what testing looks like for these smart contracts that you can, you, you can just run these tests like this to check your code. It's a truffle test. All right. If you want to learn how to do testing, you get a course, check out those other tutorials on my channel where I do testing. Um, and of course we do testing quite extensively inside the blockchain bootcamp. And I highly recommend, uh, that if you want an advanced testing, um, example. All right. So uh, we run the tests, just like trouble tests like this and all the tests pass. So our code works. And then now what we want to do is go ahead and revisit the client side portion of the application and start building that out. Now let's start coding a client side project. So go back to your terminal and make sure that your uh, server is running. So again, I've uh, you know started a new server here. Uh, you just do npm run start. Okay, make sure you've installed your node modules. And uh, this will start the application in a new in a new window here, um, and you can see the starter template. We've got a uh, you know UI framework here. This is Bootstrap. Uh, we got some starter code for us with the D storage name here. All right, a place for our address, and then a blank canvas to put the body code with you know a little bit of text here, so we can see uh, where to edit this. Okay, so make sure that's running. Uh, we're also going to do a few more setup steps. The, the first thing we need to do is uh, set up MetaMask to talk to Ganache, okay? And so find Ganache wherever you installed it, you know, make sure it's running. Uh, it should be running already if you put the smart contract on there. But anyways, uh, take this URL here, this RPC server URL. This is the URL to talk to Ganache. Uh, then go to MetaMask and uh, you want to change the network. So do custom RPC down here uh, and paste in the URL. So I've already done this. So it's going to tell me, you know, one already exists. You could give it a name, Ganache here, if you wanted to. I click save, all right, and then go change to that network. So I'm going to click on Ganache, all right. All right, so make sure you're connected to Ganache. You need to see your account balance listed here uh, if you've imported your account. So the next step is to do that. Um, go to Ganache, show your private key. So, you know, don't do this for real in the real world. Don't show this uh, to anybody else. Uh, don't use this private key in the real world because anybody who uses it could steal your funds. So copy this, uh, go to MetaMask, and then go to Import Account, and then paste your private key here. Click Import. So I've already done it. It's going to tell me it's a duplicate, but you should be able to click Import. All right. And then boom, there you go. You should see your account balance here. Uh, you have an account that's connected to um, the blockchain. That's the whole purpose of MetaMask is to turn our web browser into a blockchain browser. And that's exactly what you've done. So uh, we're going to open up the client side application and connect it to the blockchain first. So that's the first step is to connect your web browser into a blockchain browser. Uh, and then next we're going to connect, we want to convert this application into a blockchain application, right? So let's uh, go to the client side code. Uh, that'll be the first task is connected to the blockchain. So go to source components. All right. This is where the website lives. Go to app.js. All right. And uh, this is where we will connect. This is where we'll write all the code for the application uh, and connect it to the blockchain. So this is a React.js application. We'll get back to that in a minute. But the first task here is going to be uh, to connect it to Ethereum with Web3.js. So if MetaMask connects our web browser to the blockchain, then Web3.js connects our application to the blockchain. So there's two steps, connect your browser to the blockchain and then connect your application to the blockchain. So um, there is a very standard way of doing this. Uh, I'm going to paste in the code and show you how to do it and then we'll explain everything. All right. Uh, I'm going to go to, let's see here. 
let me see, inside of app.js, we're going to take this configuration and put it in there. Okay, so we've got a bunch of we've got a bunch of starter code in here that we'll step through in a minute. But I'm going to go ahead and wire up the uh, uh, Web3 code. So we have this function called load Web3. You know, this is the JavaScript library for interacting with Ethereum. This basically just takes our connection from MetaMask and puts it into the application. Don't worry if you don't understand all this code. This is literally the instructions that MetaMask gives us. So there's no point in coding this out step by step. We can literally, literally just copy and paste their example. So that's what we've done here. Um, and then next, we would just want to make sure that, uh, you know, we can talk to Web3. All right. And then uh, we'll just console log that log Web3. All right. So save that. Go back to our application. Open up the console like this. And then boom, there we go. So here's our Web3 connection. All right. Boom. Done. So I just wanted to go through those steps really quickly to make sure that MetaMask is set up properly, to make sure that our app is running, and then it talks to the blockchain. Now let's explain some of the concepts here uh, and s some more of the codes so that you can understand what's going on uh, after you've seen that this works, okay? So um, here in the source directory, all the components, this components folder uh, contains all the client side code. So these components are React.js components. So we're using React to build this uh, client-side website. So React is just a JavaScript library for building user interfaces. And you can see um, that it's component-based. So basically, you organize all your code into these React components uh, where you can mix JavaScript and HTML in the same file. So you can see this you know, class hello message is written in JavaScript. Uh, but then it has some HTML code in here for, you know, like hello world, basically, and have this render function. It's a very similar thing in our project. You know, we have an app extends component, and then uh, we have a render function down here that lays all the content out on the page, you know, of course, with some more JavaScript inside of it. Um, we have something called React State. All right, and state basically just gives us a, a database of sorts on our client side application. So here's a good example, like this to-do list. So if you're gonna add a to-do list and have like item one, uh, item two, uh, sorry, item two. <laughs> you know, how, where are these items stored? Like how did this content get updated? Well, React has something called the state object that handles that. It has an array inside of here that holds all the items. You can see that right here. Uh, and the, that items array is what, you know, allows us to list these items out on the page and it acts like, like acts like a database in that sense. Okay. So that's where, um, yeah, that's what we need. Uh, that's, that's what, that's what the state object does. And we'll do the same thing in our application. Uh, basically the state object will be like, uh, the front end database for all the blockchain data inside the app. Okay. So, uh, yeah, those are the main features of React that we're going to use are the components and the state, okay? So those are the main, main things to explain. And you can see, uh, you know, we've got this state object here inside our um, project already, this constructor function. This is just the function that runs when the components created, all right? And you can uh, see this state in action. So we'll, we'll create this again. Okay? So we got a few more things. We got a few more components here. We have a nav bar component, which you can see here, and then a main component, which also you know has the content for the page. We'll fill these. Uh, we'll fill these out as well. Okay. Uh, so let's go back to the app, and you can see the flow here. Basically, whenever this app, uh, whenever this component loads, we'll have this component will mount function. So this is just a lifecycle callback inside of React. Okay. Basically, whenever the component's going to get added to the DOM or added to the page, basically, this function is going to run, okay? This is a special function. This is a magic function from React. And so we call two functions inside of here. The first is load web three. That's what this does. It connects the app to the blockchain. And the second function is load blockchain data, all right? And that's where we did this inside of here. We just got the web three connection and logged to the console. So now we're actually going to add some more blockchain data to the page. We're going to get the account. We're going to get the smart contract and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So uh, I'll load the account like this. We're going to use the web three get accounts method. So uh, let's do it like this. Say const accounts equals, let's see here, uh, web three get accounts. And then let's console log that. 
All right. Save that, go back to page and see that here. So here's the accounts, boom. All right. So now let's uh, actually do something with this data. Let's put it on the page. Uh, we're going to use that React state object that I talked about a minute ago and save the account to the state so that we can fetch it back out to the page. All right. So we add the account to the state like this. We just say, well, instead of console locking it, we say this dot set state. That's how we add new items to the React state. And then we give it an object, okay? And we say account equals accounts zero. So remember, accounts was an array here. So we can just access the first account from the list with uh, zero, right? So this would be the account from MetaMask. And then um, we want to put this account here, all right? So what we're going to do is uh, pass it down to this navbar component, all right, so we, that's what, how we do it right here. Account equals this dot state dot account. All right, that's and so then inside the nav bar, what we do is uh, say this dot props dot account. Okay, and then boom, there we go. All right, so now it's on the page, um, and yeah, so. It's important to know we use this dot state that account to assign the account, all right? But this is something called props. So if you want to pass data down to a new React component, we use this syntax here. This account here is called a prop, okay, or a property basically. And then we can reference those properties inside of this new component navbar like this. So this dot props dot account. So not this dot state that account inside here. It's this dot props dot account because we're not using the state object, okay? So now we can see that on the page. That's good progress. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, the next thing we want to do is configure this a little more. All right. We want to add a special uh, at, uh, an icon to the nav bar. So I'm just going to copy this from the final code solution instead of coding it out step by step because it's kind of long. Uh, but basically, we're going to use this identicons library here inside the package.json file. Uh, to automatically generate a special user avatar for each user based on their Ethereum address. It'll just do it programmatically, okay? So we'll do that with identicons like this, boom. So uh, see this new identicon, all right, which uh, is going to create a cool picture for us, which we can see here. All right, so we got a little issue. Uh, let me just... Uh, fix this, all right? So it's telling it can't read substring of undefined. That's because we haven't implemented the loader yet, I believe. So I'll show you how to fix that. Um, basically, we want to create a way for our app to uh, load, all right? So basically, like, uh, the app, uh, we won't know when the app is loading and when it's, when it's actually, you know, we want to keep track of whether it's loading and if it is loading, then we want to, uh, you know, uh, do certain things. And if, if it's not loading, we don't want to do certain things. So you can see that already wired up. You can say this.state.loading. If it is loading, then show the loader. If not, then, uh, you know, render the page. So let's fix that. All right. So say uh, loading equals false. Okay. So let's see if that fixes it. I think it might not actually... Or actually loading is true. Okay. And then uh, whenever this is done, let's see here. Let's try this. All right, so that still didn't fix it. So let me let me just fix it real fast. I think I think it's something else actually. All right, so it looks like there's a little issue here. So I'm going to fix this. Let's we'll say this.props.account. Uh, I'll use this. I'm going to say if it exists, then we'll do this. And if not, uh, then we'll do this. I'll just say 0x0. Zero zero. So let's see if that fixes it. <laughs> All right, so let's look at a problem here. Uh, let's try it like this. Oops, hold on.
So this is not the best way to write this, of course, but this will fix the problem. All right, so let's just save that for now. All right, boom, there we go. So this is nice. It, uh, it abbreviates the uh, abbreviates the address so it doesn't look really big on the page like that. All right, so that should fix the problem. All right. So now let's go back and continue on coding out the application. All right, so let's go back to uh, app.js and continue filling this out. So the next thing we want to do is actually get a copy of the smart contract that we just created from the blockchain. And um, we want to um, add it to the project like this. So I'm going to go over, I'm just going to do the code from the final code solution. Uh, so we don't save some time here and I'll explain it. So we'll just go ahead and fill the rest of this out like this. Um, basically do this. Take this in here. Okay. Because I want to get to the IPFS part because that's the really important part of the tutorial. So um, what we do here is first get the network ID. All right. So every Ethereum-based network has an ID. Uh, Ganache here has an ID of 5777. All right. And so what we want to do is uh, basically create a JavaScript version of the dstored smart contract that we created in the previous section. Okay. So with Web3, we can do that like this. Web3 ETH contract. Okay. And so we can create a new Web3 contract like this. We say new Web3 ETH contract. And we need two pieces of information. Piece Information piece number one is the JSON interface. So this is the ABI. It's basically just a JSON description of how the smart contract works, the functions it has, and all that kind of stuff. And the next is the address, the location of the smart contract in the blockchain. So we get that information like this. So we see a you know, new Web3 ETH contract. So the dstorage ABI comes from this file. So if you go to uh, source ABIs, dstorage, you can see it right here. All right, so that's piece number one. It goes here. And the next is the network data, the, the address. Okay, so you can see the address here. Uh, let's look for 5777. Okay, let me just find it. You can see the address here. Okay, boom, there it is. So um, one important thing to note is that this smart contract could be deployed to multiple networks. It could be deployed to Ganache, the Ethereum mainnet, a test network, et cetera, et cetera. And the address will probably change every time that happens. So Truffle stores these addresses under each individual network ID. So here's Ganache 5777. Here's the specific address for Ganache. And so that's what we do here. Basically, we fetch the network ID that we're connected to inside MetaMask. We get the network ID, or sorry, right here. Web3 ETH get net ID, all right? And then we uh, basically get this network data right here. Okay, that's what networks is. D storage networks. And then we pass in this network ID 5777 from Ganache. And then basically if that exists, then we create a new JavaScript version of the smart contract like this. And if it doesn't exist, we'll say, hey, you know, this smart contract doesn't live on this network. So uh, here's an example. We can just go to MetaMask and... Uh, change networks but first it looks like d storage isn't imported so at the top of the file make sure you import it like this boom import d storage okay so here we go and then we can inside metamask we can go to uh let's just go to like mainnet refresh the page and it'll say boom d storage contract not deployed to detect network okay so we can see that here you know it, it didn't have this network data so it gave us this alert all right. And uh, so that's working. And now we can just uh, change back to, or sorry, change back to uh, Ganache. Okay. So boom, there we go. All right. So then uh, we set that to, to state. So let's go ahead and update the state object as well. Um, we can just basically update the state from the final code solution like this. All right. Okay. And then, um, yeah, that's how it'll work. And then we can say, if we get the files count. This is the number of files that runs out the app. All right. We say dstorage.methods.file count. Uh, that's how we interact with it in JavaScript. And we say call to get it back from the JS. And then say this.states.filescount. 
And then now we want to load all of the files from the smart contract like this. We use a for loop in JavaScript. We basically get the files count. We start with that. And then we count backwards. So we start off with the latest ID and then subtract each one. All right. And then we just get all the files and then set the file like this. Okay. So I'll save that, go back to the page, make sure everything works properly. And boom, there we go. We're good. All right. So now um, we want to uh, actually wire up the application to store files onto IPFS. So that'll be the next step. Because remember, you know, we do this. It's it's a multi-step process. We add the file to IPFS. Then once the we get it back, we get this hash. And then we add that to the smart contract here. Okay. So we're going to uh, create a func. We need to first create a connection to IPFS like this. So I'll put this at the top of the file. It's pretty simple. Uh, we use the IPFS client from our package.json file. All right. And then we connect it to a free Infura client like this. So the host is IPFS.infura.io. We use port 5001. We use the HTTP protocol. HTTP, sorry, HTTPS protocol. And so now we have an IPFS object inside our app that we can call. We can say like upload, you know, add, all that kind of stuff, you know, you know, read. Um, so I'll, sh I'll show you how that works momentarily. So let's go ahead and uh, create a way to upload files. So we're going to do this inside the main component. All right. So inside of main.js, we'll modify this. All right. So inside of here, um, we will uh, use a basic form that allows to upload a file off, you know, from, from our computer and then put an IPFS and that's what we'll do right here. So I'm going to take the form from the final code solution and put it here. So is this D storage starter code. We're going to take this out and then take out these two commented lines. Okay. So like, boom, take this out and then add this boom. All right. So here's the div. All right. That's going to contain the form. So everything inside of here is going to be the form for uploading the files. So we can save that and uh, go back to our page and see it. Boom. All right. So here's the share file section. You know, we, it's going to basically allow us to choose a file, add a description like a you know, foo bar, and then upload it for our Dropbox. Okay. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, well, we can't do it yet because we don't have it wired up. Let's wire up the part that lets us do that. So let's look at what this does. Um, so uploading a file is going to be a two, there's really a three step process. Okay. So uh, I'm going to put those steps down here. So step one. Uh, process file or you can say prepare file for upload step two upload file to IPFS and step three will be um, let's say store on blockchain okay so we've already kind of talked about step two and three where we publish the file to IPFS, we get back this hash and then we store this hash on the blockchain so we can read it later. But um, basically uh, it, there's a preliminary step, which is that we prepare the file and convert it to a very specific file format uh, so that it can be actually uploaded to IPFS. So that's what we want to do here. So uh, you can see this line here. So input, this is the file form input. We have this on change handler. So this is called this props.capture file. So this is going to be a function that we're going to code out here in a second. What this is going to do is uh, convert the file to something called a buffer that will allow it to be uploaded to IPFS. So we'll do that inside the main app.js file right here. So uh, that's, what we'll, that's what we'll do in capture file. Okay. Um, so inside of capture file, we'll, we'll do this. All right. So I'll show you. So first we prevent the default behavior of the form. We don't want, you know, want to submit and refresh the page or anything like that. Um, so we first say const file we basically are going to get the file from the form field. Okay. And then we use the file, the native file reader. Uh, from the JavaScript window object. And then we convert it to a buffer. All right. So you can see what that looks like right here. 
All right, we, we use a capture file. Um, you know, we pass it down here, and then basically whenever we upload a file, it's going to capture it and convert it to this buffer object and uh, uh, log it to the console. So you'll see what that looks like. So I'm going to actually upload a file screen. I don't want to reveal my uh, file contents here, so I'll do it off screen. Let me just find a quick file. I'm going to, uh, yeah, let's do this. This works. This is a screenshot of my tutorial right now. So here's the file. And you can see once I've uploaded it, you can see this log to the console here. This is this uh, a buffer array. Okay. And basically this is just how, this is the format that we need the file in JavaScript in order to put an IPFS. So that's what this first step is, is it processes the, uh, it processes the files. So that's this. Prepare a file for upload. We just did that. So basically, whenever we upload a file, whenever we add a file with this file field, it calls on change, which calls this capture file. And then this capture file does this code to convert it to a buffer. All right. And we log it to the console. So now we want to do the next step, which is upload it to IPFS. All right. So we're going to do that on the form submission. Okay. So uh, you can see the on submit handler. I'm sorry, it's the nav bar. On the on submit handler, so form on submit. Uh, we say prevent, prevent default. Um, we capture the file description and then we uh, upload the file with the this props the upload file function. All right. So that's going to be uh, this right here. This special function that we're going to code out step by step, which is also passed in here. All right. So, um, you know, step one or step two, I guess, step one of this section, but step two overall is now take this file that we've captured and upload it to IPFS. So we'll do that like this. We'll first say submitting file to IPFS. And then uh, we take our IPFS connection from up here. All right. And then we just call... Uh, ipfs.add and say this.state.buffer, which we created here, all right? And then we say, you know, error results. And then uh, we can say console.log. Uh, let's see here, ipfs results. Say results size, okay? All right, so let's log this out to the console here. I'll go back to the uh, terminal, or sorry, the window. And I'm going to upload this off screen. Choose file. I'm going to do a, a, a screenshot of my whiteboard here, and then you know we can see that it was the it was converted to an array buffer here. Click upload. Okay, let's do a description. Let's say foo bar upload. We say submitting file to IPFS, and then uh, here's IPFS results. So it worked, but it looks like we didn't actually, uh, it's like we didn't properly return this. So let's just make sure, oops. Let's just make sure this was right. So we don't actually want to do result size, we want to do results, sorry. Let's try it again, foobar. Choose a file of screens so that that code was wrong. Just fix it. All right, let's try this. Click upload. Submitting IPFS. All right, boom. There we go. Here's our result. All right. Yeah, we can see it. Yeah, here we go. Here's the path. All right, here's the hash. Awesome. All right. So you can see uh, it worked. And here's the hash on IPFS. So. Um, like I said here, step one is prepare the file. Next is upload to IPFS. We get a hash back just like this. So here's our actual IPFS hash that we got. Take out the quotation marks. You know, we can go view this on uh, in our web browser. So I can say like, uh, you know, if you're uh, IPFS. Well, let me just actually get the URL. Let me look here. Um, let's see here. we can preview it in our browser. So I can go here and in my URL bar, do this and you know, ipfs.mfear.io forward slash IPFS and then paste in the hash. And then there's a moment of truth. Boom, there we go. There's our file that I just uploaded. 
So, uh, you know, here's the hash that we got back. And then you can just use the IPFS gateway to view it. Um, and I just took a screenshot of my whiteboard and, you know, saved it so I could upload it. And there it is. Awesome. So that's step one and two. Step one is to prepare the file for upload. Step two is to upload it to IPFS, which we've done. Now step three is to store it on the blockchain. All right. So inside of the, uh, you know, app.js file, uh, we're going to do that next step, which is put it on the blockchain. We're going to use, um, uh, uh, well, first let's do a little more code. Um, basically if there's any, let's do some error handling. If there's any errors here, we're going to, you know, return. Um, if there was, uh, we'll make sure it's, it's loading. We want to set loading to true. And then next, um, we want to set the file type here. All right. We set the file type like this. Okay. And then next, uh, we're actually going to upload it to the blockchain um, with Web3 like this. All right. So, boom. So this will be this dot state dot dstorage methods. So upload file. This is the this is the bulk of step three. So we get the hash back from IPFS. We give it the uh, size of the file, the type. All right, the name, the description. All right, we call send from this dot state dot account. All right, and then whenever that's finished on transaction hash, we set the loading state to false. All right, all that kind of stuff. So save that. Clear out all this code. Go back to the application here. Let's find it. <laughs> I think mine actually disappeared. So I'll put it back here. All right, refresh. Maybe upload my file off screen. And we'll just call it my screenshot. All right, I'll click upload and submit it to IBFS. And boom, here we go. So now we have to actually, uh, you know, sign this transaction to put it on the blockchain. So we, we pay for this, you know, we pay this small fee inside MetaMask to store it, you know, with Ethereum. Click confirm. All right. And I've got an error. So let's just fix that. So um, I got a little issue. My MetaMask, you know, failed. So let's just do this. Um, I'm going to reset my account MetaMask. So sometimes this happens. Uh, sometimes if you get the, you see this error, uh, you just need to reset your account. Like you restart Ganache or something. I actually want to leave this on screen so you guys can see how this works. Um, so, uh, it basically, let me just remember how it works. Account details. Uh, actually it's the settings, I believe. So if you go to your account icon up here and then go to, uh, let's see your settings, you can go to advanced and then reset account. All right, so this won't mess up anything. It'll just reset your transaction history on MetaMask. Let's click reset. All right, so that's done. Let's refresh the page. And I'm gonna try to upload one more time. So we'll say, here's a screenshot. Say my screenshot. All right, pull this back over here. Click upload and let's see if it works. Confirm. And boom, there we go. Awesome success. So now um, it worked. It's submitted to the blockchain, but we can't see any of our files on the page. That's going to be the last step. We want to list out all the files, um, you know, from from the smart contract onto the page. So um, we've already loaded all the files into the app like this. So load files and sort by the newest right here. Here's this step, right? And we save them to this right here. So the last thing you want to do is put them uh, inside here. We're going to do it with a table and we're going to map over all the items in that table and put them on the page. So we've also passed the files uh, down here. So this files is here. So we can just access, you know, this dot props inside of here. Uh, so basically what I'm going to do is just take out this table. I'm going to add the code from the final solution like this. So, so you just collapse this. All right, and then put it in here. Boom, it's a table. So uh, this is an HTML table, all right? And then we have a table header and table rows. 
So basically, we just have the ID, the name, the description, type, size, date, you know, uploader, viewer, and then the IPFS hash. And what we do is take this dot props dot files. We map over each of them. We have the file and the key, and we create a new table row for each file. So we just you know uh, lo loop through all these and then give give the data. So here's the, here's each row for those. Okay. So let's click save and take a look. All right, boom, there we go. All right. So here is our uh, here's our file, okay. And so we can click on this, uh, and this will be like the share link. So it's how Dropbox works. You know, you can see, you can store your files here, and you can see the file name. You can see the description. Uh, you know, the type, the size. So you could build an entire file store system like this. And the whole idea is it's a social app, it's a sharing app. So you can say, you know, hey, I want to send you a file over a text message or something like that then you can uh, click that share URL. You could just copy this link and then send it to somebody over a text message over an email. If you have some sort of decentralized chat system or maybe like a uh, uh, an encrypted chat network like Telegram, for example, like a secret chat, you know, you could uh, have no trace of your communication and, you know, store it, you know, send a uh, IPFS file like that. It's pretty cool. So we can just, you know, battle test this and add some more files. I'm going to choose another one here. Let me see if, see if I can fix like, uh, um, let's do this. Okay. Do another image. So we'll see like, uh, juicy swap. <laughs> this is a, this is an app that I built. All right. It's a picture of an app that I built. Click save and then boom, there we go. Automatically adds it to the page and we can see the hash here. Okay. All right. Boom. Very cool. Awesome. Yeah. All right. There you go. So there's your completed application. This is your Dropbox clone with blockchain. Uh, so congratulations, especially if this is your first time, you know, building a decentralized application. Uh, you've come a long way. You know, you've you've used the blockchain. You've created a smart contract. You've created a React based application uh, that uses IPFS to create this, you know, unstoppable censorship resistant uh, D app, right. For, uh, storing files. So you can go, you can take this application and, and build on it. You can make it, you know, add more features to it. Um, so yeah, I hope you like this video. Again, the final code solution is always here, uh, on GitHub. So if you want to check, uh, any of those, you know, something doesn't work for you in the tutorial, you can go check this link. Uh, and if you like this video and you want to take the next step, you know, what should you do? Well, first you should, you know, smash the like button down below, subscribe to this channel that really helps these videos out so that more people can find them. You know, we spend a lot of time making these tutorials for you all. So that's always appreciated. And then of course, you know, if, if you, if you like this, you want to take the next step, learn how to build a real world blockchain application, uh, decentralized cryptocurrency exchange so that you can, you know, land a high paying job, become a freelancer, you know, build your own project, then uh, you can, I can show you how to do that over at dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. Just click the link right here, sign up today, and I'll show you how to do that step by step. All right. So that's all I've got for today. And until next time, thanks for watching Dappy Diversity.